stifled, worn out, or just bored with your nine to five or nine to nine job, I want you to know that you're not alone. I was there too, till I started asking and wondering if there was another way to live and work where I could actually be more of me. In this episode, I bring to you real conversations with real people who have chosen to step out of their nine to five employment and create a life for themselves that is more in line with their inner rhythm. Good morning, Sharda. Good morning, Ramya. How are you? I'm good. Thank you so much for coming on to this interview series. And uh, I do this series because I want to bring out really interesting journeys, but also because I want to learn. And talking to you is something I've really been looking forward to because I know personally for me, there are going to be so many learnings and takeaways from this. So I've been really looking forward to hearing your journey. And uh, <clears throat> we can, um, I'd like to start, you know, uh, just taking you back to your MBA days and you can take us back before that if you think it's important and uh, because like a lot of our listeners and like me you know so you have an um, MBA from IIM Bangalore and after that you worked with some big names you worked in the conventional corporate world in marketing and uh, and then there was, uh, beyond that, there have been a series of very interesting ventures that you've been part of. So you started your own company, you sold it off, you have uh, created a second beautiful company, you're passionate about an entire space of holistic healthcare, you've been looking at how you can create an impact in that broader realm beyond just companies, you do mentoring, you're an independent director on boards of different companies. So I just see a portfolio of very interesting activities that, uh, you know, that are led by maybe one or two or a few different passions or things that are really core and important to you, but would love to know how this journey started and how it's been panning out. And uh, so if you take us back to your MBA days. From I always thought I was a recent entrepreneur, except when I was doing some a recent interview um, is when it struck me that actually 50% of my career has been an entrepreneurship, 50% and only 50% in the corporate world. So, uh, and, you know, but the, between my two entrepreneurial ventures, it's been like chalk and cheese and between the world of entrepreneurship and the world of having a nine to five corporate career, again, cheese and chalk. So, um, am I, have I grown, got a lot of gray hairs after all of this? Certainly. But am I glad all of this happened? Most certainly, yes. Um, nothing happened in, you know, it's strangely enough, um, most of my life, has panned out without any structured planning. Uh, I would say, I would uh, 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 ascribe a lot of the, what I've done and achieved so far to, to two things. One is serendipity, of course, and hard work. But honestly, nothing was planned. The only thing I really planned, and this is back, this is why I did my MBA, was somehow was the seed always sown in my head that I need to be financially independent as a woman. And as I went along, I realized that it came from an underlying streak of somebody who in relationships, uh, both personal and professional, would like to um, you know, take decisions, be, uh, take the lead. Um, and therefore I wanted to be in charge. I wanted to be um, the downside of wanting to, of course, wanting to be in control, but it's the fact that I was very, very clear that I needed a career and I wanted to be somebody independent. Um, initially it was financial, but later on, as I started working, I realized, no, this is what gives me the kicks. This is what really makes me happy. So that's how, um, the whole corporate career, uh, started. And I was always interested in the area of consumer products. My favorite was actually to get a job with either Nestle or uh, Britannia, because I thought foods was the most exciting part, but Hey, I got it in an equally interesting company at Johnson and Johnson. And I thought starting your career in the world of baby bums and uh, uh, baby skin uh, and sanitary napkins was um, was very interesting. And I you know, I think it was not just interesting, but it was very genteel. j and as a company um, is guided by what it's known by, uh, by a document is called as credo. Or the credo actually sets the values that the organization will espouse. And that 
is such, it's so genteel. It says we always will put our customers, doctors, nurses, mothers, and babies at the forefront of all our decision making. And that culture, I think, almost in a way mollycoddled me um, in my early stage of uh, corporate career. Most people, you know, they're out doing brutal sales work. And I think I was really lucky. So early career, uh, as I said, was all about uh, saying I wanted to be independent. And I think I had a fantastic family support, um, both pre uh, before I got married from my parents, who never forced me to say that, you know, it's time to get married, time to do, you know, you can't be working, etc. Because I was um, probably the first woman in my, uh, um, no, I wouldn't say first, my aunt, my aunt did, but one of the few women who worked. Uh, and more importantly, after I uh, got married as well. So yeah, a bit of a, that's the beginning of my uh, career, both nine to five and outside nine to five. Wow, that's that's so interesting. And you know, even as uh, you were talking about, it's, um, you know, something that I read or heard somewhere that left an impact in me that you can't see or appreciate something in someone else when it's not there in you. And just what you mentioned about the JNJ culture, which is, you know, the gentleness and putting the doctors, the nurses, the babies, the mothers at the forefront. Uh, knowing what I know about Sepalika, that's sort of the culture that you embody to me also. And I'm, you know, here I am going, it, it was in her all along and that's why she could see and appreciate it in the place that she was working for. Yeah, absolutely. And also, and I think this is pertinent to the, um, to the program that you produce is that I think I was, and I think there's so much value in having worked in the corporate sector and then become an entrepreneur because I had fantastic set of bosses See, you really learn culture from people. It can be embodied in a written document like a credo, but it has to be lived by the people. And I can't tell you how lucky I have been to have absolutely fabulous bosses who were not just great for, let's say, you know, visioning and strategic direction, etc., but for being great people uh, leaders. And to me, as an entrepreneur, if you tell me that is the single most valuable lesson that I've carried forward into Sepalika, which is how do you be a people person? How do you, and I, you know, I still, I'm, I, you know, when people team members join and I recently had somebody who's joined in my sales team, she says, you know, ma'am, I, I can't imagine somebody as senior as you who's actually teaching me and handholding me to the extent that I have never ever seen in my career. And I think I got it all from my bosses. So as an entrepreneur, when you are able to work in the corporate sector, and be as lucky as I was to pick those values uh, and then bring them forward. I think it is yes. priceless. Yes. And, and, you know, and I'm just thinking, I'm listening to you and I'm marveling at this, you know, what you mentioned, the serendipity and the serendipity of the, you know, the bosses and the mentors that you got in the corporate sector and the, the culture that you could bring into your entrepreneurial venture, because it doesn't happen that way for everyone. So we have the whole range of experiences that people can have at the in the corporate world. And I'm so glad that you had, you know, these elements that you could just imbibe, carry through, and then leverage now in what you do and pass on clearly to the people who are working with you. And so what happened after your stint at JNJ? I then moved into the ritzy, glitzy, glamorous world of Coca-Cola. <laughs> At that time, it was um, like the way the, um, the internet companies today are um, the talk of the town. Uh, and before that was the telecom uh, players. Um, at that time, and this was in the early 2000s, it was the world of cola wars in India. So two player market, uh, whoever hit the uh, Kirana store at 7 a.m. with their truck, he got market share. So it was, you know, it was glamorous, it was, at pace that I was completely not used to. Um, it was all about big monies. It was big risks and everything that you did had such a huge impact that for me, it was a bit of a culture shock. Um, I also burnt my fingers because what I told, see media always ran behind you. So one part of it is you feel good about it, but the way media would quote or misquote you in the press could you know, have a, such a huge impact on the organization. And I had so many hard lessons. So yes, JJ and Coke were like, again, another chalk and cheese uh, story for me. 
Uh, but I learned so much. I think I grew up very quickly at Coke um, from the world of being molly coddled at J&J uh, when I joined as a management trainee to uh, having to take decisions to um, meeting film stars where you think it's very glamorous, but it really is not. It can be, it can be so frustrating at times. Um, you have to pander to their egos, but you also know that they deliver certain uh, results for you as a business um, to where every decimal point in market share has you know, crores and crores of an impact on your uh, revenues. I think um, you know, Coke was the real, the, the big bad, the, not the bad, but the big corporate <laughs> world. Um, learning is what I got from Coke. And I, I, I would say that it added an entirely new um, perspective or uh, uh, part to my corporate le career learning, which again, I could take forward when I moved into my entrepreneurial venture. Yeah, so um, three fabulous years and exciting years at uh, Coca-Cola. That's, that's so interesting, uh, Sharda, because, you know, we learn and we grow the most from contrasts. Yeah. And, and this contrast that you got to experience fairly early in your career, right? And they're quite extremes, J and J, the gentleness and the aggressiveness and the cutthroat competitiveness of, you know, the Cola Wars and Coke and really being exposed to both the extremes, working and experiencing yourself show up in both the extremes. That, that must have given you a lot of clarity as well in terms of where would you like to go forward in this entire spectrum and Absolutely. you know where where's Sharda thriving and you know where does she belong <laughs> I, I love the point that you made um I'll come to that but before that you see what I learned was that while while the um if I ever tried to take the JJ culture and bring it to coke saying you know it's so beautiful it's so lovely I, we would have been eaten up by competition so you needed the culture of Coca-Cola when you're doing, you know, competing in this two-player market. So remember that cultures are unique to organizations. Cultures are unique to the kind of businesses that they operate in. Sure, that even within a particular category like Coke and Pepsi, you can have two different cultures, although you're both operating in the beverages business. But yeah. when you try and move culture from, um, you know, one kind of organization and setup to another category, it may not move as seamlessly. So I think that was a big learning for me. Absolutely. But um, the more important thing is what you said, that where is Sharda in all of this? <laughs> that's when I realized that the probably I was more of a j, &J culture person at a DNA level than, uh, than I was, at, than I am a Coke culture person. And I think that is what that understanding of the DNA um, which, of course, always comes to most of us belatedly in life, uh, once I cross and, and, You know, in, in some ways, it almost can't come unless you've experienced yourself in, in the contrast, in what's not you, to know what is you in some ways. You're right, because I'm trying to uh, you know, train my young uh, daughter, who's just, start, just graduated from college, and she's getting into the work sphere, into trying to realize all of this. And then I realize it's a bit of a futile exercise. <laughs> because like you said, you have to experience it to realize it. Yeah. But yes, that realization has what helped me decide um, the path that I want Sepalika, which is my current um, health uh, care venture, the path that I wanted to take. I think, and that is that has to be unique to my business um, or, or unique to us versus what other healthcare ventures in the same, let's say, women's health space are doing today. That's what will distinguish or that's what will make me successful as an entrepreneur is to build an organization, not just from a culture perspective, but to chart its, its, its path um, in line with the DNA of the founders. I love that word. Yes, the DNA of the founders, absolutely. And, and the early experiences that you know to even find, understand, and recognize your own DNA. That's so beautiful. And uh, what happened after that, post-Coke? So, you know, I could, I almost want to stay on at, you know, and ask you so many more questions about your learnings from Coke, but I know there are goodies to come ahead. So we'll move ahead. Yeah. So, Sometime during my, so by the time I was in Coke, I'd all, almost done about, um, you know, 14, 15 years of brands and marketing. And that's when, you know, my boss and I, we sat and said, listen, when you're working in a multinational, your career path is almost predetermined. You know, it's, you know, it's certain that usually you would work 
let's say if you're working in marketing function in a country like India, you will be sent abroad to work in another emerging market at a slightly senior level. Um, then they would then move you to a larger, uh, slightly more developed market. Then they would move you to what they call as a franchise or a brand role. So you sort of, you knew where you were going over the next 10 years, right? It was fairly certain. But then something told us, you know, is this what we want to do all our life? And when we sat and de debated and discussed, we said, no, you know, maybe we should try something different. And what was a different space? We said, yes, we needed to leverage what we did all along or what we were good at, which is brands and marketing. But we needed to go beyond um, a typical nine to five uh, marketing job. And that's when it struck us. Um, the thought that struck us was, hey, there's really nobody in India who is the McKinsey of the marketing world. So you had McKinsey, which did business and strategy consulting, but the equivalent of an organization which did consulting in the area of brands and marketing didn't exist. There were individuals, but there were no organizations. And that's what we set out to do. So that was my first uh, venture um, set up uh, back in 20, 2005. Um, it was, we called it Market Gate Consulting. And over 10 years, we worked with about 140, 50 clients across 25, 30 sectors, way, way beyond consumers and uh, consumer marketing. Uh, to help them both with their business strategy and with their marketing strategy. Wow. So, so tell, tell me more about these 10 years and what were your key learnings, takeaways, experiences? What shook you? What gratified you? What helped you bloom in those 10 years? Well, the first one was that I, we moved from Coke where we ran 100 crore plus budgets, fancy offices, um, doors opened immediately, um, media was calling you, suddenly to say, oh my God, we have to now find an office. Where do we find an office? How do we locate a broker? Who's going to you know, furnish that office? Who's going to buy bathroom supplies for that office? There is nobody, there's no HR team, there's no admin, there's nothing. It began and ended with us. And this is just two of you, right? This you the two of us. And right? your boss. Uh, yeah, the two of us. And then to say, right from looking at a, you know, looking at an agreement for a rental to buying that hard pick to saying we need to recruit people, uh, we need to you know get a secretary. And remember, this was that time when there was no internet. So how do you even find headhunters who you know found teams for you? So it was a huge learning for us. Um, Which city were you based in? We were both based in Mumbai. Okay. Um, initially, we had one of our advertising agency um, partners who were very kind enough to lend us a room, which we could use temporarily till we found our own office space. Um, but it was literally starting from scratch. See, so the biggest thing when you move from a corporate job to being an entrepreneur is that that entire structure that you almost take for granted, the fact that there is somebody holding you, it's almost like somebody is holding you and preventing you from falling. When you, or if you fell, there are two hands behind you, right? Yeah. Now all that is gone. It's all up to us, right? So I think there's that part that was a you know, bit of a shocker. The other part was when you are in, in the corporate world, especially when you're in working for a multinational, people came knocking on your doors. Now as an entrepreneur, I had to go knocking on people's doors because I needed their business. And there was this assumption. I thought that, you know, I called them, I sent them their presentations or my credentials they would respond. They didn't respond. I'm like saying, why wouldn't you have the courtesy to respond? But I'm not on their priority list. For me, they may be important, right? But they have a hundred different things to do. So the fact that, you know, ego takes a bit of a hit and you've got to be willing to accept that you're now almost like starting at the bottom of the totem pole. Even though you may, you may have called the shots at uh, large multinationals in your previous life. So, those are the kind of um, changes that I think um, hit us. But I, I, simultaneously, I think we were really lucky because we could use our uh, J&J and Coca-Cola calling cards for doors to open. I think we were really lucky there. I can't imagine if I was starting from scratch, how would I do it? Do, how would I have done it then when there was no social media, there was no Google, there was no internet, there was nothing there. So uh, yes, so those were the, I would say those are the two big changes um, uh, that happened. But I think for me, it was fantastic learning because I had always been used, or we had always been used to selling consumer products. 
And then now to now talk to somebody in the insurance sector, to talk to somebody who's selling furniture, to talk to people who are doing jewelry, and then to convince them that I could still deliver, even though I didn't come with that experience, um, to talk to people in the food industry. And they were all our clients. As I said, we moved from being a single sector expert to having worked across 30 sectors. They were not easy because people were challenging us. So uh, the air airline industry, um, they said, How, what do you guys know about uh, airlines? Um, so it took us a while. It took us a lot of convincing hospitals. Um, but I think that would have, I mean, I can't tell you what an enriching experience those 10 years was. So one was the ability to move across 30 sectors. The second was, remember, we had always worked for multinationals where they automatically attracted talent from the IAMs, from the top business schools. And they had a certain culture, whether it was j, &J or Coke, it was, you know, uh, you know what they say, Unis B's Kafarak. But you now started working with Indian organizations, Indian entrepreneurs, and then you suddenly realize that they have an entirely different culture, 180 degree difference. And you have to learn how to adjust. I learned then how to appreciate. I think my admiration for, the in, for uh, marketing folks in Indian companies went up so many notches. Because when you're working for multinational or global brands, the brand print is given to you. It's already been established somewhere else in the world, or rather across the world. And all you're doing is adapting it to India. Whereas as an Indian brand, you're starting from scratch. You are defining it. And I think that was wow. so much more exciting. To me, that would have been the highlight of uh, the work that we did um, at uh, MarketGate. Lovely. So, you know, just sort of recapping some of uh, the key learnings that I got from this. The one thing that really struck me was, uh, you know, the imagery that you used in terms of when you're in a nine to five job and you're working for a bigger company, it's like you have the support that when you fall, you have these hands to hold. And, and I was just looking at, you know, those hands going over and sometimes, you know, different people and uh, you know some of the critiques of a nine to five job or <clears throat> working in a large organization is that you can feel suffocated or you can feel like your degrees of freedom are restricted and you don't have all the freedom that you want but we forget this part of it which is that when you fall you have those many hands to hold you so <clears throat> i think that is such i'm going to keep this imagery in mind and that's such a useful thing to actually keep in mind and consider and uh, the other beautiful takeaway that I, uh, you know, learned is really the ego has to dissolve at some place or go down or come down. And I mean, you know, life gives us lots of opportunities for that. And this is as good as any other, which is really, you know, what I see is like when you're working for a big brand, it's almost like, um, you know, like the buyer and seller mindset you almost have this buyer mindset, people come knocking at you and you're like, I like this, I don't like this, I'll do business with you and I won't. As opposed to when you're selling and you have to go out and knocking and you are pitching, not the work that you do, but also yourself. Because I guess initially when your team was small, you were pitching yourself and selling yourself, which is, some, which is a whole new game, something that you probably never had to do earlier in your life. And... Uh, taking a mindset shift. Yeah, but you know, not just initially, and I find that um, even all through those 10 years that we ran MarketGate, it was always the founders. See, companies want to see the founders. They're the, not just the face of the brand, but they need the reassurance of founders because it was a small firm, you know, a boutique consulting firm. So what was your size at the end of the 10, largest size that you grew to? In terms of- uh, uh, Number of employees? Yeah, eight of us. Okay, so it was really, yeah. Really it was really, yeah. yeah. Uh, but unlike today's ventures, we were making money from day one. Okay. There's no concept <laughs> of cash burn. Remember, we started it uh, at a time when there was, there was no concept called startup world, VCs, PEs, uh, Series A, um, you know, pre-money uh, valuation, nothing. You needed to spend from your own pocket. Nobody was funding going to be funding you. Get so it. Jolly well make money. You can't burn. There's nothing called burn. So we were still operating on the traditional PL model. And yet, hey, we still made it successful. You see, that's what I even today um, I'm still fascinated that it's like being bootstrapped and continuing to be bootstrapped for a decade. And still being, you know, being profitable. 
which we could do because of the you know the industry that we were in and i understand that not all businesses can do that um but yeah um that was i think i think that was a big learning that i still continue that i took away from that venture wonderful and what next ah After so then you know um we sold the company at the end of 10 years we sold it to the publicist group uh, i still remember when we did when we were doing looking at the term sheet and discussing the term sheet they didn't even know how to value us because they had never done you know india hadn't seen those kind of deals or um sales of um service uh, businesses happening at that point in time how did how did you decide to even think of you know selling again the same thing right 10 you had done 10 years of it um here was somebody uh, uh, approached us um and we said why not it seemed an attractive enough they approached you yeah and remember by that time coincidently the the seeds of my current venture sepalika had been sown so i had already begun you know thinking of the next venture um uh, because of you know the various reasons that led me to set up uh, sapalika so those incidents had happened events had happened so, so what are those incidents and events so it's um it was and, and i'm sure you must have seen this in my some of my earlier videos it was a personal health crisis of having suffered from chronic migraine for almost 10 years and not finding any solution with the best of experts um in the world of let's say um neurology uh, orthopedics uh, general practitioners headache experts um, been through all their medication all kinds of treatment and nothing seemed to work and until i met my current co-founder who at that time was practicing alternate medicine uh, today i like to call that uh, i don't like to call it alternate and mainstream uh, they are just two different various kinds of branches of medicine but um, he was the one who within 4 months helped me get over migraines which i had experienced for 16 hours in a day for up to sometimes up to 3 weeks in a month so that's how bad it was so um he i not just you know when he uh, when i saw the results on myself i got into work with my family with my friends and i said man i can't believe that vitamins and minerals can have such a huge impact on health i always thought they were just you know nice to have things and now you're telling me you can actually heal or reverse a lot of chronic health conditions using these basic that's when i sort of re really looked at vitamins so vitals are actually vital i mean they're absolutely vital for the functioning of the human body and it made me realize how critical they are and how they get lost every day and we don't realize it as human beings and how sometimes it can be so simple to just restore them and get better so that idea had already the germination had begun and so when this whole uh, so that's how i sold off uh, market gate and um, you know worked with mahesh my current co-founder to say why don't we get more people to be aware so my goal at that point in time was just building awareness and that's how we set up sepalika purely as a content platform wow so you know shada i love this part of your story this is like you talked about serendipity and i see so much more beyond that of course there's serendipity but it's such a beautiful coming together of two things right one is your own personal experience and therefore your discovery of this oh my god you know there is this way and i will not call it alternate either because why should it be called alternate there is this there is one way of looking at health and helping us bloom and recover and do well which not too many people know about and i've experienced it so you experience it yourself and the other pillar which is all your years of experience in marketing and in creating a brand in creating awareness in you know basically taking something and making it available to a large audience and then you put these two things together and uh, i just i just love that so it's 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 very touching in some ways you know that these two can come together and 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 you had all that experience growing and waiting for mm. this you yeah. know something that you really yeah. wanted to take out now and not, not the really. coke not the baby products <laughs> not helping others but it's something that you believe yeah. in yeah so one of the things ramya realized is that for an entrepreneurial venture to be successful the idea of that business has to touch you some way you should have something should have impacted you in some way 
me, for, and you know, you can see a lot of these um, uh, founders, they always have personal experiences which led them to set up their venture. But if you start a venture just because you can see, hey, there's so much money to be made. Hey, look at those guys. I mean, like they're being talked about in the papers. Maybe, you know, and there's room for many more. When you do something like that, I'm not saying it can't be successful, but to sustain it, because as an entrepreneur, you can go through shit. I mean, there's so many hurdles to cross, so many potholes you fall into, and nobody will hear of it because nobody wants to hear um, these stories, right? You, even you as an individual will gloss over them when you want to talk to others, not just media, but you know, friends or family or, or whatever, your, your, your network. And for you to survive, and sustain yourself, the only way is if that idea has touched or hit a raw nerve somewhere. And it not need, need not always be negatively so. Like in my case, it was because I, I went through hell when I went through that pain, but it could have been in, in, in even positively, but it needs to touch your heart at some, some point. Otherwise, it's very hard to sustain um, when, when you're solo. Wow. I, I so get that. I get that because I'm a newly turned entrepreneur, if I may say. I mean, I, it's, I'm not really an entrepreneur, but I am as well. And I do get the ups and downs and how it can get really rough and tough at times. And uh, let's talk about that a little because, you know, one of the things that people listening to this would, I think, really benefit learning from is, you know, some of the rough and tough spots that can be part and often are a part of an entrepreneurial journey, which again, like you said, nobody talks about. And so we don't hear about it. And, um, you know, it's, it's bad pre-known is being pre-armed and getting right. into it. Yeah. So I think I had greater learnings in my current venture than I had in at MarketGate for two reasons. One is MarketGate was almost, the consulting firm that I ran was almost like an extension of what I did in my previous life. So instead of, it's just that instead of working for one brand, you're working for, you know, five brands at a time, or you worked over hundred brands over 10 years, but it was the same marketing, positioning, strategy work. Um, here, I was moving, in, it, it was an entirely new space of health. By then, you know, the, the whole internet world had started. And mine here was a D, uh, you know, um, a D2C, uh, you know, um, B2C business. There it was a B2B, right? Now, in a B2C business and in a time when you're entering a category which is completely new to you, it's not easy. So the number of mistakes or things that you're not prepared for are far greater. While I came from the world of marketing, I didn't realize that the world of digital marketing is chalk and cheese compared to the world <laughs> of offline marketing. Because you don't know how Facebook and Google algorithms work. You don't realize that unlike television where you have a very, um, uh, uh, you know for certainty that this is going to be the audience size. These are the guys going to be watching me. There are only a limited number of programs people watch. And remember, I'm talking about television before the pre-OTT days. Here, the audience is so fragmented in their media choices. So getting them is very hard. And in a country like India, medicine is never sold. It's always bought, which means that if you are unwell, you would normally ask a, a, a relative, a colleague, um, a friend to refer a doctor to. You would never go on to practice and find a doctor and then, you know, just call them up and consult with them, right? So those kind of uh, barriers I had um, and therefore I wasn't prepared and I had to, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I stumbled far more in this, even though I was much older and hopefully much wiser, but I took far greater beating in, the, uh, in this venture because the number of unknowns and the number of variables were far greater. And I think as an entrepreneur, that's something that you, no one can be prepared for it. But I think mentally you need to be prepared to accept that this is how things were going to be. I didn't. I thought I would be able to translate, um, broadly translate the path that I went on the, my first venture into my second venture. Yes. Wow. And I think just by sharing this, <clears throat> uh, you know, anyone watching this and contemplating about setting up their own venture will now know from your experience to be prepared that the number of variables, the number of unknowns is likely to be huge. It's likely to be unpredictable before you actually get in and start doing it and burning your fingers or 
getting a beating and uh, and learning from it, right? Learning from every beating and burning. And tell us what helped you keep that learning hat on because we hear this a lot. Yeah, growth mindset, learning mindset. But when shit really happens, it's easy to get into the blame and dejection and, you know, so what, what did you use personally, Sharda, to keep um, learning and keep, keep yeah. on? So um, what I really did was I had to learn to keep pulling back, pulling back, going and pulling back, which means that, as you said, when shit hits the ceiling, uh, you can, you know, uh, you get into debates, discussions, frustrations, whether it's with your team, whether it's your co-founder, whether it's your partners. And what I had to learn was to step back, literally step back. And very often what I would do, physically shut my laptop down, literally shut it, okay? And then think as to what happened, why did this happen? Um, so reflection um, uh, helped me a lot. Um, one of the other things that helped was, and see, I've always been very diligent about writing my tasks and following through, but, what I learned here was to zoom out. So a task list by its definition means things that you do. I instead started creating a list, which I called as like a think list, things that I need to think about. Wow. As a founder, you can't be, yes, you have to have a task list because remember you can't afford to have a team. So as I keep saying, you're the office, office girl or mundu and you're the big boss all rolled into one, even today, okay? Not, no, no issues with that. But I have to stop creating, not stop, but while I have a task list, I need to have this think list. And the think list needs to be, ensure that it's the task list only comes from that, or the to-do list, it comes from that thinking list. If I don't do that, then what happens is you often will tend to get carried away with the momentum uh, of a particular activity because, and it can suck you in like a, like a whirlpool and then like wow. quicksand you're gone. Wow. And then it can be weeks and many, many rupees later that you realize, oh my God, I should have realized one week down the line that this is where I'm going to be, but it's already three weeks too late. Wow. So, um, so Sharta, I, I love this bit about the think list and task list. I think you've just helped me and so many other people just with this little bit of, yeah, it's, it's beautiful because, um, and I'm connecting it back to what you said about you are the CEO who does the strategic thinking and the big picture analysis. You're also sort of the board of directors of your own company who does the even bigger, you know, analysis of why are we doing, where are we going and what's in it. You're also the implementer and the office boy or girl and you know we can get stuck at any of these lists and when the task list which is the implementation can take over it can really take over us so that we never actually be the ceo or board of directors of our own company that we could be so the zoom in and zoom out that's such a beautiful tip shut the laptop zoom out breathe <laughs> go back and uh, look at that Thank you so much. And, and I want to actually um, ask you about uh, your experience in being a mentor and your experience in being, uh, you know, on the board of uh, other companies where you play this think role. You yeah. think, you do this thinking and advising and the big picture, zoom out thinking for other organizations and other people. And uh, how does that help you? Yeah, actually, I love it because I'm wearing multiple hats um, at the same time. So yesterday, I had a board meeting where, as you said, it's more strategic level because there's a large team and this is a large uh, organization where they're presenting to you their annual business plans and you're, you're looking at it, you're supposed to be giving a perspective as a board member. And then literally five minutes after the board meeting is over, I am back to saying, oh, what happened to my Facebook ad? Did it get rejected or what, is it running? <laughs> so, you, you know, the, the ability to, you know, be at the stratospheric level and then come down. Um, I think I'm really lucky that I've been given these opportunities. One, of course, as a board member. Two, the mentoring role is something that, um, that sort of grew organically. Initially, it was more um, casual. So people reached out to me as individuals. 
Then, of course, we moved to this fantastic IM network of which you and I are a part, where we're doing this mentoring role. And now I actually work with an organization called Aspire for Her, where the goal is to um, motivate young women to get into the workplace and stay there. So um, there, of course, is counseling them, um, advising them on the career path. I love it because they keep me young since they're all very, very young. Uh, but I really love the fact that I'm able to share a lot of my learnings with them. And, you know, even as I articulate my learnings with them, I get fresh learnings myself. So um, it helps to clarify a lot of things in my own head as I'm speaking to uh, people in my mentoring role. Or I'm able to draw parallels from some of the discussions that happen in my board meeting for my own business, even though you know, there could be very, very uh, uh, different uh, stages and, you know, and phases. And I think that doesn't matter. The, the thing is, is how are you able to think, how are you able to parse out issues and how are you able to give a strategic perspective um, to both your business, uh, which may be of really small scale, um, to somebody who's really large, to, a, to, an, um, to somebody who's seeking your advice on men men mentoring, right? So scale doesn't matter. The issues that you face are, um, are more important, and I I'm have you know I'm really lucky to have the ability. Um, also, because I think that I had so many different kinds of experiences over the years that I have the ability to put these things together. Um, and and wow. work with so so Sharda, I I hear you, and you know when you use the word stratosphere, I think that just nailed it for me coming down from stratosphere to coming down to earth and switching back. And, and I hear you, you know, that you have this ability, but I'm sure you've honed it in some way as well. How do you keep it alive and how do you do it? Because I do know that it's not something that's very easy to do. I don't find it easy to do. And uh, I'm a coach and I work with several people and I know that it's not something that most people find very easily. So are there any practices you use or is there... Is, it, is, is there some way that you yeah, hone this ability to be able to make these switches between the different... Uh... I, I, you know, I'm really... Initially, I thought it was, you know, this whole thing about women being able to multitask versus men and that coming... And that there is a biological reason for it. It comes from the hormones, the complex system of uh, hormones that we have, which men don't have, which allow us to do this, right? Um, but... Like you said, you and I are both women, and yet, you know, we come from, you know, it's just that we are wired differently and have different personalities. What has helped me is that I realized that I've never hesitated to um, do things or let's say uh, the, my, the role does not bother me. The fact that, you know, I am the boss or I'm the, you know, mm. I'm the minion, it does that nice. or I'm the subordinate, it doesn't bother me. Which is why about um, three years ago, I realized that although I was running Sepalika as a founder and my credentials were the fact that I'd done, you know, I had a 20 year plus career um, in the corporate world and in the entrepreneurial world, I realized that the, the way to build my credentials when I get into a healthcare space, I was feeling, I had a bit of that imposter syndrome if I didn't get my healthcare credentials right, which is why I went back to school. And I don't think twice of it. Uh, when I went back to school, I had went to the US to study nutrition. And I was working with, uh, in my class were kids who were my daughter's age. That didn't bother me uh, because I was learning something new. I think, Ramya, in my mind, I have always been open to new ideas. I have always been open to perspectives. And I don't mind hearing, although I come with a very strong point of view in discussions and debates, Mm, I don't mind being uh, convinced otherwise uh, if I get in. Wow. So I think that's helped me, um, um, let's say, look at multiple things. I'm also great, my, my to-do list, I, I, I'm like a champion at creating these to-do lists. So <laughs> I think that also, um, and remember, a to-do list also has a personal list. See, this is my biggest issue with, and we uh, as women entrepreneurs um, don't have a nine to five job. Uh, personal melds into the professional we feel guilty doing the personal doing work time and then terrible that you know at night we'll have to open our laptop I think we just have to stop um, you know feeling guilty about it I have a, and I'm you know I'm un, um, unashamed about having a to-do list which comprises both the professional and the personal I actually uh, put them uh, sometimes on the same sheet or in two different columns but for me both are equally important and 
the listing of these tasks um, helps me. One of the other things that helps me is that when I start my day, one of the mistakes I used to make before is to open my laptop and start looking at mail. And as I said, you will again go into that, you will just get drawn. And I, before I know it, three hours would have gone. Mm. Right. So now I, I don't look at mail. So when I come, uh, uh, when I come to my desk and I have a routine, even though today we're working from home, I have this routine of, you know, dressing up. It can be dressing down, but it's still dressing up and coming to work. Workwear is not in sitting in my pajamas. Um, coming to my desk and then opening a book where I say, okay, what are the things that I need to do today? What are the stuff that I had from yesterday that didn't get completed? Look at my think list. Um, and so putting all these things together, putting them on paper, saying this is how I'd like my day to go, and then opening the laptop and then checking my phone. I'm not saying this is foolproof because I still fall, you know, or for a fall a victim to something that sort of drags me in, but it or helps me pull back. You know, it's almost like somebody wow. throws you an anchor or, or a life boy and, you know, you're able to hold on to it. I think that's what helps to, to start your day. The first 10 minutes of your workday should be just for you. Beautiful. And I tell my team that unless it's a medical emergency with one of our patients or clients, I shouldn't be, you know, I, I don't want to do it. So yes, every day we have a 9.30 a.m. huddle, small team. So you need to, everybody's working remotely. So you need to keep the connection going. But which means I am at my desk at 9.15. So the first 15 minutes, I know nobody's going to call me because we start only at 9.30. But that lets me, it's my time. It's my time for my work and it's my time for my personal priorities that I need to accomplish for the day. That's that's so nice, Sharda. You know, I'm, I'm just looking at these practices and tying it back to how it could be helping you in the zoom out and zoom in. And it makes so much sense. So uh, some of the things that sort of just clicked for me is one of one sentence that you said, which was that the role does not bother me and it's not bothered you. And what I see there really is uh, the identity, right? You not identifying very tightly with either the role of the CEO or the role of the implementer or the role of the office assistant or secretary or each one of them. And because you're not tightly identified with either of these roles, it gives your brain the freedom to zoom out, to detach, unhook, and go back right into the stratosphere or zoom in. So really that, you know, um, having the identity but not being very attached to it, that really clicked for me. The second thing that uh, clicked, um, you know, in this context was when you talked about engaging in debates, but really being willing to be shown otherwise, something that I've heard before which in the phrase that strong ideas weakly held, or as Roger Martin calls the opposable mind. And that's so key. So, you know, it's, yeah, thank you for embodying that and showing us the actual, you know, the business advantage of having that opposable mind. And third, of course, is, you know, this practical thing of having that to-do list and think list. And what just occurred to me is that when we don't sit down and put it on paper, we're still carrying it here, which means is that extra burden. But the practice of putting it down on paper is the other way of letting our brain unhook because now it's down on paper and it can get down when it needs to get down. So our brain is actually freed up to move into the think task or whatever else it is. So... Yeah. Thank you for these uh, practices. And uh, no, I, just I could go. Add, sorry, go on. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to add a point here. Initially, you know, a lot of this I did out of fear. Uh, fear because I felt, you know, I, I had the experience of employees leading. You know, today's world, right? People don't think twice about jumping ship when they find a better opportunity. And therefore, I, you know, after those experiences, I started developing fear. Listen, I have this employee in a small organization. When he or she leaves, that whole, you know, there's a, you know, there's a vacuum that gets created, the business suffers. So out of fear, I started learning and therefore saying, you know what, I'm ready to do multiple things. But then I realized that you, I can't be living life, you know, insecure or in this area of uh, fear. That's when I don't know where that switch happened, but somehow I started enjoying these things. So I started enjoying how to do SEO work, even though I was never meant to be an SEO person, I don't have those credentials. But I started reading and the more I read, the more I liked it. 
I also started, in, I was very hesitant about creating videos, but as a small organization, as a founder, you're the face of the organization, but I didn't want to do videos because I always, you know, <laughs> it was always being, being conscious, worried, am I going to look okay? Is it, am I going to sound foolish? Um, again, when I step back and say, no, it is for the sake of the business, it's for getting more people aware of that fantastic service and the product that we offer is when I started enjoying. And the moment I started enjoying and moved away from a, you know, um, a place of insecurity and fear to saying it's enjoyment, I started doing more of it. Wow. Very powerful stuff here. So Sharda, very powerful stuff. You know, tapping into the purpose, tapping into enjoyment as ways to overcome the fear and, and the benefit of that really that now you've learned to do all these various things and you know you can do it and therefore then the fear doesn't even kick in anymore so nice you know i could go on and on and on with this and learning from your experiences but um, in the interest of time i'm going to ask you to you know uh, give us your top three learnings takeaway pieces of advice if you don't like the word advice substitute it with something else for people who are right now in a nine to five job and who are sort of toying with this idea and possibility of Maybe I could do something outside of this and maybe I'd like to do something on my own. So what would your top three things hmm. them be? Um, the first I think would be what I already spoke to you about, which is that as is somebody who wants to you know, set out on an entrepreneurial journey, ensure that you have an internal motivator. Don't go beyond external benchmarks. And remember the benchmarks that you set are yours and yours alone, because if you don't do that, you will start moving in a direction that you don't, that you will find yourself not wanting to. So remember, and the motivator has to always come from the inside, right? The, the second advice would be, and this is my learning from my second venture, which is that understand what does it take for you to be successful in your business? And what well, will you do? Can you elaborate that a little more? So, which is that, for example, for me to success, be successful at Sepalika, I need to have, remember, I'm in the, you know, in the medical field or in the healthcare space where uh, trust and credibility is important. Uh -huh. So let's say you're, my, you're going to be my client. You need to understand why should I believe Sipalika? Why should I believe what Shadwa is saying? Oh, she is a certified um, thera uh, therapeutic nutritionist. Um, and she has certain additional qualifications, right? So now I, or she has a team or her team of therapists all have certain qualifications, right? So that's critical. So for me, I cannot hire any nutritionist. I need the nutritionist to follow certain principles, what we call as functional medicine, which is a very different way of looking at health issues, looking at root cause, being able to look at different parts of the human body and not focusing on a particular organ. Now, those are the things that will help me deliver results to my patients. The fact that we need to put out these videos um, we need to be seen. So those are things that are critical to for Sepalika as a business to succeed. So I have to see what am I as a co-founder or what am I as a senior member bringing to the table. Then what, what else do you need beyond that, right? Like you that, yeah. what the, And yeah, when so I start out the venture or when I'm going along, have I resourced for the rest? Maybe I don't have it. Maybe my co-founder doesn't have it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but am I providing for the rest? So you have to think through these things right at the outset. So if it means that you have to, you know, work through your world of Facebook, Instagram, Meta, Google, and you know that it doesn't come to you, ensure that you have a resource and you've provided for that resource. These Thank things have to be thought through before, not that, oh, I had chronic migraine, so-and-so helped me, my co-founder helped me, now let's try and make a business out of it. How are you going to get people? <laughs> Why will they believe you? How are you going to build awareness? You sitting in one place in Mumbai, he's sitting somewhere in Delhi, billions of people you know, on, on Facebook at any point in time, how will they even notice you, right? So remember, there's a difference between a passion and making a business out of the passion. Yeah. So, um, and my last bit is that always look at what are the personal commitments that you have in life. And by that, I don't mean just financial, because an entrepreneurial journey can suck the light, life out of you in many ways than you can imagine. So is it there's a certain commitment to family, 
to relationships, right? Um, to um, I, you know, other obligations that you may have. Because an entrepreneur's life is never a nine to five. It will take up your time and it will take up mind space. And remember that your entrepreneurial journey can is a subset of your life goals. You have certain wow. here. So work goals must always be a subset of life goals. Unfortunately, when we all begin our corporate career, we're taught the other way around. Boss <laughs> asks you to stay late, you stay late. You, you need to travel because, you know, uh, but you can't be at And you squeeze in your life goal somewhere in the gaps. <laughs> you don't, you, you, you miss social functions. You, oh, I can't attend your birth trip because you know what? I need to stay late at work. I need, you know, I have an office meeting coming up. I need to work on, you know, I can't go on a picnic on the weekend because, uh, you know, I need to finish this presentation. Why should the presentation, why should the picnic not be important? It is you, right? So life goals come and or rather work goals or entrepreneurial goals are a subset of your life goals. And always remember that. That's so nice. That's so beautiful and so useful and yeah, so important. And for that, you know, you need to even sit down, zoom out, like you say, and create those life goals and maybe even revisit them, you know, once a year or whatever, you, you know, works for you. And then look at the work goals as a subset and fitting the work goals. Thank you so much, Sharda. It's been useful more than useful it's been it's been like a mini class for me <laughs> and uh, and i hope it's it's that way you know uh, so many powerful takeaways nuggets of gold in terms of changing mindsets in terms of actual practices in terms of being pre-warned and you know having having yeah thinking about certain things beforehand rather than later and uh, thank you so much for your generosity with that um and it, it, it shows, you know, what showed for me was your love and passion for helping others, the mentoring that you do. And uh, clearly, and what I didn't have time to spend much time discussing, but what I took away in a nutshell is how you see it not as charity, but as a two-way learning. And, you know, how, how you are gaining from each of these things that you're doing, which is such a beautiful symbiotic way of looking at, uh, everything that you do and uh, truly touched by that as well so thank you for all these gifts and uh, hope to see you around I absolutely loved every minute of this so I must thank you <laughs> take care. thank you bye bye if you are someone who's looking to craft your life and work in a way that is more in line with your inner rhythm, then do visit my website, www.craftingourlives.com. You'll find it in the description because I have a host of resources put together for you. And this is based on 20 years of my own research and work and work with people as a coach in this area. I also have a free newsletter. So your starting points should be to sign up for my newsletter subscribe to this channel to stay updated for further videos and to go on to the edX site and look for my free MOOC course there titled crafting realities work happiness and meaning and and then reach out to me if you need further assistance i also offer private coaching as well as i run group coaching sessions and i also conduct residential retreats and you can find all those info all that information on my website or in the newsletter as and when we announce it